Hello, I'm Ted Gamble, Chair of the British Architectural Library Trust. The Trust is the nonprofit entity that supports the library and collections of the Royal Institute of British Architects in London. This is the second in our 2023 lecture series, which we are presenting in collaboration with the 20th Century Society. Based in the UK, the 20th Century Society focuses on architectural education and on preserving significant 20th century buildings in Britain. Today's lecture is entitled Giles Gilbert Scott and the Definition of Modernity Between the Wars. It will be presented by David Lewis, Professor of Architectural History at Oxford University and author of Modernizing Tradition, The Architectural Thought of Giles Gilbert Scott. After his lecture, David will be joined by Alan Powers, former chair of the 20th Century Society for further conversation. Also, we have a very special guest today, Rosemary Hill, who will be saying a few words before the lecture. Rosemary joins us in paying tribute to her late husband, Gavin Stamp, a highly respected architectural historian and journalist and a specialist on the work of Giles Gilbert Scott. Rosemary is herself a noted historian, as well as the prize-winning author of God's Architect, the biography of A.W.N. Puget. Rosemary is also a contributing editor at the, the, the Review of Books and a fellow of All Souls College, Oxford. Gavin's last unfinished book, which Rosemary is preparing for publication next year, is a survey of British architecture between the wars. His next work was to have been a monograph on Giles Gilbert Scott. I am now honored to introduce Rosemary Hill. Thank you very much. Um, and I am very pleased and indeed honored to have been asked to introduce tonight's lecture in this series, which as you've explained is being produced jointly with the 20th Century Society. Gavin was a long time chairman of the society and he led or contributed to many of its campaigns to save important buildings from the period after the First World War. Two of the most notable and successful campaigns that the society fought were centered on buildings by Giles Scott. One was the Bankside Power Station, which went on to enjoy another life as Tate Modern. The other and more contested was Battersea Power Station, which has only just come back to life uh, as, a, as a combination of retail and housing spaces. Although Gavin didn't live to write his projected monograph on Giles Scott, he did, as we've just heard, leave a near complete text for his history of British architecture between the wars. And that will appear from profile books next year. Naturally, Giles Scott looms very large in it. And I think that for Gavin, Giles Scott embodied the complexity and the grandeur of the 20th century, especially those turbulent decades after the Great War as they found expression through architecture. The romantic solemnity of Liverpool Cathedral, the Jazz Age deco decoration of Battersea, the witty, pragmatic telephone kiosk, and the brooding authority of the Cambridge Library of the University Library at Cambridge. In all of these, and in Scott's rejection of stylistic dogmatism, he was for Gavin both a hero and an emblematic figure. And I look forward, as we all do, very much to David talking to us about the man and his work. David. Thank you, Rosemary. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I thought I would start with a riddle for uh, that for some of you, you'll know the answer to it immediately. Giles Gilbert Scott, the designer of Battersea Power Station in the House of Commons chamber, has more heritage listed structures to his name than any other architect. His grandfather, George Gilbert Scott Sr., the architect of the Albert Memorial and the Midland Grand Hotel at St. Pancras, was famously prolific, designing over 700 buildings. But the name of his grandson, Giles Gilbert Scott, returns 2,609 entries in the statutory list. Now, acknowledging that about three dozen of these are because listing officers have confused him with his grandfather, that still leaves over 2,500 listed structures. And Scott had only a small office with never more than eight employees and insisted on overseeing every design himself. How is this possible? The answer, of course, 
is that he was the designer of the red telephone box. And it is thanks to the tireless campaigning of uh, Dr. Gavin Stamp that a large number of these structures are protected for us to enjoy today. Dr. Stamp was the greatest authority on British architecture between the wars, and it is wonderful to learn this afternoon from Rosemary that she is finishing his final book on the subject, and that we will be able to enjoy more of his insight into the period. Um, and particularly that we will be able to learn more about Giles Gilbert Scott, uh, on whom Dr. Stamp was the great expert. And there is uh, a Google Doodle of the red telephone box that appeared on Giles Gilbert Scott's birthday a few years ago. Giles Gilbert Scott and Edwin Lutyens were perhaps the two international star architects of British architecture between the wars. Scott was knighted at the age of 44, was elected president of Reba in its centenary year, and he became the youngest royal academician since Turner. His architecture is particularly interesting because his career spanned from 1902 to 1960, a time when modern architecture as we know it was being forged, and when there were many different ideas about what modern architecture could look like. Here are some of Scott's best known works. Battersea Power Station, the Liverpool Anglican Cathedral with its incredible Piranesian interiors. Uh, a number of atmospheric churches, such as St. Alphages in Bath, with a cosmati pavement uh, made of cut linoleum. Uh, the chapel of the Univers of University College in Toronto. Um, his nave at Downside Abbey and his amazing tomb there uh, for uh, Cardinal Gasquet. And the headquarters of the Salvation Army in London uh, and Bankside Power Station, just to name a few. Um, as well as, of course, the House of Commons chamber. The place to begin an overview of Scott's work, I think, is with Liverpool Cathedral, his masterpiece, which dominated his entire career. Some of you will know how Scott won the commission for Liverpool Anglican Cathedral in 1903, when he was an unknown 22-year-old assistant in the office of Temple Moore. He was the son and grandson of famous architects, but the only one of his designs that had ever been built was a pipe rack made by his sister. The drawing for this pipe rack survives in a private collection in New Jersey, and it is not even a particularly clever or beautiful pipe rack. And yet he was selected over all of the leading architects in the United Kingdom to design the first Protestant cathedral to be built in England since the Reformation and the largest realized church project of its era in Europe. The committee was worried that he was too young and inexperienced, so they appointed the great Victorian church architect George Frederick Bodley to oversee Scott's work. After Bodley died in 1907, Scott completely redesigned the cathedral, transforming it into the composition we know today, with the tall central tower flanked by two pairs of transepts, creating a broadly symmetrical composition that critics felt brought the order of classicism to the structural virtuosity of Gothic. The design was unlike any cathedral built before, with a vast central space under the tower for seating the large metropolitan congregations expected in a sizable industrial city. The nave itself was short and would be screened from the larger space by a bridge so that the great space of the cathedral would be revealed as one moved into the building. This was in contrast to having a large space revealed all at once and moving into the smaller chancel later in the service, which Scott explained was the spatial sequence at most cathedrals, and he felt an anticlimax. The creation of the large crossing space was an inspiration. Scott would have realized quite quickly that his original competition design would not have held the number of worshipers the cathedral was ultimately expecting and he was faced with the need to revise. Enlarging the central space was nearly the only way to fit the required additional seats. However, as you can see from this drawing from circa 1908, um, which is perhaps when Scott first begins to come to terms with the idea of the central space, 
This was not merely a matter of pragmatic revision, but an aesthetic and theoretical one as well. Where did the idea of a large central crossing come from? In 1908, Scott was sharing space with the firm of G.F. Bodley, now run by an architect named Cecil Hare. Bodley's firm was also working on designing a cathedral at this time, the Episcopal Cathedral of San Francisco. Bodley's design for San Francisco was ultimately rejected, and the commission was given to an American firm who built the Grace Cathedral that we know today. But it was the design of the rejected San Francisco Cathedral that led to an interesting mystery related to the community of architects with whom Scott shared space at Gray's End. Scott needed to find a way to add 1,000 seats to Liverpool Cathedral, a nearly 50% increase on his competition winning design. Hare was facing a similar problem at San Francisco. The cathedral Bodley had designed was about 1,000 seats short. Around the same time in 1909, Hare revised the design of San Francisco Cathedral, planning a large octagonal crossing space in order to increase, to increase the seating capacity to 3,000. Many have assumed that since he was sharing an office with Scott, he had simply stolen the Liverpool idea before it was published. However, Michael Hall has discovered a letter from the American Architects of Record in San Francisco suggesting that an octagonal crossing made possible by steel framing, something which Bodley abhorred, might solve the seating capacity problem. It would also allow for larger windows. The windows spanning buttress to buttress in the revised design for Liverpool are something else that Hare had been accused of cribbing from Scott. Could the influence then have been the other way around? Could the idea for a large steel framed crossing tower at Liverpool have come from the American architects by a Cecil Hare. Without knowing the precise dates of Scott's cathedral drawings, it is impossible, of course, to say. The obvious precedent for seating in a crossing space was in fact American. H.H. H. Richardson's Trinity Church in Boston had been designed in the 1870s. In an attempt to fuse the clear sight lines of an American auditorium style preaching box, with the plan of a traditional European cruciform church, Richardson had put the majority of his seating in a wide crossing under a central tower. This was one of the most famous works of American architecture. It may have been where the San Francisco architects got the crossing idea, but it was also very likely that Scott would have already been familiar with Trinity Church. Not only was it widely published in Britain as part of a late 19th century fad for New England architecture, but Scott had an unlikely link to Richardson. He had designed a new set of gates for Richardson's only building in Europe, a country house called Lululand. So he had already made a careful study of Richardson's work. Regardless of the source of the crossing idea, it took a certain amount of genius to reconcile everything into such a powerful final design. And it was with the cathedral revision that the world recognized Scott's genius for the first time. It was lauded in the international architectural press as a breakthrough. A number of American architects themselves engaged on vast cathedral projects declared him to be the greatest living architect. And so Scott entered the 1920s at a critical high point of his career. The critic Charles Riley declared that there were only two true geniuses in contemporary British art. Augustus John and Giles Gilbert Scott, because only they could tap into the abstraction that spoke to realms beyond the conscious mind. British critics of the early 1920s were wild about Scott's work. Here was British modernity, an architectural avant-garde in line with the most exciting international art movements. What had Scott done to inspire this critical euphoria? It was not a matter of simply designing an aesthetically pleasing or clever cathedral. And he was not, as this narrative so far seems to imply, a one hit wonder. Excitement about Scott's work had been building since well before the cathedral redesign was published. He was not an arts and crafts designer, an approach that some critics by the early 1900s were beginning to find uninspiring. 
nor was he in line with the cosmopolitan international Beaux-Arts classicism of the Ritz hotels, transatlantic liners, and Piccadilly Circus. Rather, he was regarded as a highly intellectual and theoretical architect, and thus, rather than pointing to beauty in his work, critics often pointed to its genius. Giles Gilbert Scott is perhaps best known today for his later works, The Red Telephone Box, Battersea Power Station, The House of Commons Chamber. Yet he first made his reputation during the Edwardian era as a brilliant young church architect. Having won the competition to design Liverpool Cathedral, he then proceeded to create a series of dark and moody churches with soaring spotlit sanctuaries and battered slab-like towers that felt as if they had been carved out of living rock. The dramatic lighting of Scott's churches and the faceted surfaces of their walls were meant to inspire emotion, which Scott said, borrowing Tolstoy's definition, was the primary aim of true art. Critics found all this immensely exciting, and Scott's reputation would reach its crest in 1924, when the chancel of Liverpool Cathedral was completed and consecrated, and he was knighted by George V in a suite at the Adelphi Hotel. It was Cambridge that would first invite Scott to move beyond ecclesiastical architecture. Amidst the critical euphoria of the early 1920s, Scott was given his first major secular commission, the Memorial Court at Clare College, Cambridge in 1921. The commission for the Cambridge University Library would follow on its heels two years later. And from there, a series of large and small commissions at Oxford and Cambridge, projects for clients including King's College and Trinity College, Cambridge, Maudlin College, Lady Margaret Hall, and the Society of Home Students in Oxford, and the extension of Oxford's Bodleian Library on Broad Street. Oxbridge provided a place for Scott to work out his theories about the nature of history and tradition. Critics of the era were preoccupied with the question of how one could build in such a sensitive historic setting as Oxford or Cambridge in a way that enhanced the place rather than clashing with it or worse, detracting from its character. Charles Marriott, architecture critic for the Times, wrote in 1924 that the new architecture in Oxford didn't count as modern because special rules obviously applied there and the key concern was to blend in. Working in Oxford and Cambridge would especially shape Scott's architectural philosophy. He believed that architecture was evolutionary. The form, scale, and material of buildings should respond to the tradition of their location. The architect should then move a step forward from that, adding a modern plan, using modern structural materials, developing new details. Radical individuality, he felt, was foolish, not only because it created aesthetic clashes, but because even functional elements, such as those developed over time to deal with climate, could be lost. Tradition, Scott explained, was the result of hundreds of architectural minds working on the same problem over hundreds of years, evolving solutions uniquely attuned to place and community, full of subtleties that an individual mind had no hope of developing alone. He explained in 1921, tradition is collective effort and coll collective thinking. It is just like modern machinery, the cumulative result of innovation. Le Corbusier would, of course, similarly suggest that iterative refinement was the basis of good design when he published Towards a New Architecture two years later. Developing architecture gradually was not only the best way to design, but it showed respect for a community and was inherently community building. Scott would stick to this definition of good architecture for his entire career, but as the decades passed, the language he used would change with the times from the language of formalism and refinement to that of psychology and scientific experiment that became increasing, increasingly fashionable in the interwar years. <clears throat> to understand Scott's design philosophy, perhaps we should look at one of his collegiate projects. For example, his buildings at Lady Margaret Hall in Oxford. Scott was given this commission in 1931. The existing college buildings, 
set in a garden beside the River Charwell, had been, had been designed by Reginald Blumfield before the First World War. Scott designed a new wing of residential accommodation and offices called the Denneke Building, a new dining hall, and a chapel that together doubled the size of the college and created a new public face to the small road that served as the primary way for automobiles to access the college. The brick chapel had round arches and an octagonal lantern roofed in pan tiles, and the Denneke building was in a species of Neo-Georgian. In material and scale, the Denneke building harmonized with Reginald Blumfield's existing work. However, it featured experimental details, such as strange, very horizontal windows created by flanking sashes in the central block with side lights. Scott designed the windows without architraves and nearly flush with the exterior wall surface. It felt as if the facade had somehow been stretched taut across the frame. The emphasis on horizontality continued in the hall, where the usual vertical orientation of molded wooden paneling was replaced with wide horizontal panels, ultimately making it difficult to hang portraits. Modernistic detail was thus grafted onto historical form in unusual ways. The most architecturally elaborate piece of the ensemble was the chapel. It featured some of the same sort of flattened bleached wood detailing seen in the Cambridge University Library, perhaps inspired by Scandinavian classicism. Gerthard Rendell called Scott an architect exceptionally sensitive to the tastes and aspirations of his contemporaries. However, it would be a mistake to assume that Scott was swept along by the tide of fashion. The rapid mutation of his architecture was more the result of a willingness to try new ideas in the search to move tradition forward. As new architectural ideas came into vogue, he would take the forms he found most compatible with his own ideas and throw them into the mix, like adding chocolate chips to an existing recipe for cookie dough. As the years progressed, he would not hesitate to tweak the recipe, discarding ideas he felt were unsuccessful and keeping those that he felt improved the flavor. Thus, what critics have frequently seen as the irreconcilable variety of Scott's designs was in fact the result of a controlled process of experimentation that was in keeping with modernist ideas about refinement. This process of design by experimentation made Scott's approach seem highly modern, evoking the scientific method in a way that was similar to the international modernists. The architect in Building News noted in relation to the uh, chapel at Lady Margaret Hall that Scott's quote, continued experiments might evolve a church form that would be established as those of earlier epochs. The magazine felt that Scott was driving architectural evolution forward, despite the quote, justifiable criticism that his designs adhere too closely to traditional forms. Scott responded that he felt architecture should be the result of evolution, not revolution. And at the micro scale of his own design, he practiced what he preached. He defended this method in a letter to Christopher Hussey in 1944. The past has always been used as a foundation and slowly developed and improved to meet contemporary needs. This evolutionary system produced such wonderful results and was in such universal use, both through, through the ages and throughout the world, that it seems to have proved itself conclusively to be the right method. Scandinavian classicism itself was seen as an experimental style within which architects struggled to reinvent the classical tradition for the modern age. In 1932, Riley wrote, what seems certain is that but for the inventiveness controlled by good taste, such as Lutyens and certain modern Swedish architects have shown, the steel or reinforced concrete substructure would by now have everywhere broken through and mastered the appearance of the bigger buildings as it is already beginning to do in Germany and America. Reinforced concrete nearly broke through at Lady Margaret Hall, in fact, as Scott designed a concrete dome and left it visible from the interior of the chapel, thus proclaiming the modern nature of the worship space to congregants below. In an ironic twist of fate, as it was the only, it was only um, 
it was one of the very few times that Scott used exposed concrete anywhere. The chapel acoustics proved very bad, and the dome had to be covered with an absorbent asbestos spray and painted like plaster not long after the chapel opened. Construction photos still testify to Scott's futuristic concrete dome, however, showing its shell perched atop the structural masonry walls of the incomplete building. The great record of Scott's experimentation, however, is not in his built buildings, but rather in the myriad sketches and drawings held in the Drawings and Archives collection of Reba. These drawings include churches with multiple naves meeting at angles, apartment buildings with serrated plans so that each unit faced the sun, and catenary arches built in steel and concrete. One such experiment was his radical rejected design for rebuilding Coventry Cathedral with two naves on either side of a central altar. The altar was designed to rotate if there were only a congregation in one of the naves or to be viewed from the side if there were congregants in both. The central space featured four pulpits from which lectors could read responsively or preachers could debate with one another. And the former chancel of the bombed historic cathedral was repurposed as a choir loft transept high above the floor level of the sunken nave. It was this interest in experimental methods that explained Scott's strange design for Oxford's new Bodleian Library. Scott's best known Oxford building was commissioned in 1934, not long after he completed work at Lady Margaret Hall. The new Bodleian on Broad Street, now known as the Weston Library, is the most prominently cited interwar building in Oxford, right at the university's ceremonial heart. It is a building which many have considered ugly, but you can probably begin to sense the explanation Scott gave for its design. It was an expression of his philosophy of gradually developing architectural tradition. Scott's solution to the problem of finding a modern style that blended with the Oxford context was to fuse classical ornament executed in stone onto a building with stepped massing and curved corners, massing that almost could have been that of a contemporary department store. Critics, however, um, have often called this application of classical ornament to modernistic forms naive, and yet it has its own logic. The original Bodleian, itself featured the fusion of classical ornament onto Gothic forms at a time when a fully classical British architecture had yet to develop. Thus, the new Bodleian featured classical ornament fused onto modernistic forms at a time when Scott felt a fully modern British architecture had yet to develop. He saw his architecture as a bridge to the future, neither one thing nor the other. It was meant to anticipate the British modernism that would come later in the same way the full-fledged Renaissance had come to Britain with Inigo Jones and Christopher Wren. It must be remembered that Wren did not suddenly impose this Renaissance upon the Gothic, Scott wrote in analogy to his own building. There was an interesting period of transition from Gothic to Renaissance, lasting 100 years before Wren came on the scene. Thus, Scott saw his Bodleian project as an attempt to lay the groundwork for the future of modern architecture. He had long discussed this project with his mentor, C.H. Riley. Scott's main objection to international modernism as it was developing was its machine aesthetic and resultant lack of good detailing. In 1933, Scott had given a speech at Reba advocating a middle line in architecture, stating the necessity of restrained ornament. I want to see modernism's best features and characteristics retained and grafted at first onto the architecture of the past and then gradually developed, he said. Scott and Riley both felt that international modernism was not appropriate in historic contexts. Scott had replied to his early critics in the 1937 article in Oxford Magazine, writing that international modernism on Broad Street would have been as dreadful as a jazz band in Westminster Abbey. If Scott's goal was not explicitly to create an A-Styler building, 
it was to shut it was to shunt the question of style aside. At the 1938 garden party, opening his only other executed work in the style of the new Bodleian, Hartland House at the Oxford Society of Home Students, quote, Sir Giles defied anyone to say what style the building was in. By throwing in a little bit of everything, Scott hoped to jam the stylistic radar and force viewers to evaluate the building in terms of formal elements and appropriateness to function and context. His way of doing this was novel in the extreme. At Hartland House, there was perhaps a touch of Gothic in the battlemented towers and the Renaissance in the overdoor, he explained. The building itself certainly had a sound English character in that it was made of good English stone, not of concrete, chromium, and plate glass. Here, and at the New Bodleian, was a fresh attempt at answering the international modernists. The New Bodleian style was thus one of his greatest experiments in architectural theory and one of the boldest actions in the interwar search for a distinctly English modern architecture. The guests at the Oxford Society of Home Students Garden Party were delighted. When the New Bodleian itself was unveiled, however, the critical reaction was not what Scott had hoped. The critics were baffled, unable to see what Scott was trying to do. Many were able only to see a horrible mishmash, a modern building disguising itself as traditional or vice versa. John Betjeman called it one of the half-hearted attempts to blend the ancient with the modern, contrasting it with what he characterized as the boldness of the Radcliffe camera. The Reverend S. E. Cottom, a fellow of Exeter, wrote, as a student of architecture and a lover of beauty, I am aghast at such ugliness. The ground floor is like a vast shop front, divided by meaningless pilasters and supported, uh, supporting equally meaningless urns. The top story is even worse than the ground floor, being just like a factory. If it is put up, which God forbid, it will be a disgrace to the city. The initial criticisms would become quickly enshrined in Oxford opinion. From the anonymous critic of the architect and building news down to Pevsner's round condemnation decades later, many felt that instead of achieving the blend of traditional and modern that he sought, Scott had achieved a sort of schizophrenia. Howard Colvin would quip in the 1980s that the building was ludicrous, like a dinner jacket made out of Harris tweed. In a broader university context, the new Bodleian was undertaken under the umbrella of the Oxford Appeal, the largest fundraising drive in the university's history, linking the project, at least financially, to the expansion of the science estate and the expansion of the Radcliffe Hospital. All of these changes were regarded as part of a general drive towards modernization, creating the most technologically cutting edge and flexible facilities possible so that they could serve the university's needs far into the foreseeable future. Scientific analogies were embedded in the language used to describe the building. The library wanted space for experiment. For his part, Scott talked of the frenetic technology-driven pace of modern life and made science fiction-like predictions to the press. When the building was completed, the architect confidently declared that it would serve the needs of the library for 200 years. But what would the needs of the library be in 200 years, he wondered. Perhaps libraries as we know them will by then have ceased to exist, he mused, and a central television station will wireless visions of books to readers' homes, and they will turn the pages by pressing a button. But these are nightmare speculations. The creation of such technocratic mythology was part of the identity-making process for many of Scott's major institutional facilities in the 1930s. At the opening of the Cambridge University Library, for instance, the King had called it a powerhouse and a testing station of educational activities. And the Cambridge University Library too was undertaken in tandem with the expansion of the university's science facilities. The plan of the new Bodleian was also unusual and disliked. The building consisted of a central core of standardized steel stacks from the Ronio Company, the same product used at the New York Public Library. This artificially lit and ventilated stack tower 
was surrounded by a ring of auxiliary naturally lit services, a plan form inspired by recent American designs, such as Yale's Sterling Library and the Library of Congress extension. The stacks were to contain 5 million books, an enormous number for such a small site. By contrast, Charles Holden's skyscraper library at the University of London was designed to hold less than 1 million volumes. At the Bodleian, a large proportion of the books would end up underground, but Scott was trapped between a high water table and an 80 foot height restriction imposed by the city. The ring of auxiliary services was to provide generous staff accommodation with a bindery and fumigating room, as well as experimental spaces that could be allotted to study rooms for specific disciplines. The intention was to create a highly efficient storage space for books. Readers in the historic reading rooms across the road could request books by filling out slips of paper. The slips would then be fired across to the new Bodleian in pneumatic tubes and waiting librarians would quickly roll a cart to the appropriate location, get the books, place them in a lift, and then send them to the reading rooms via a conveyor belt in a tunnel under the road. The system sounds a bit outlandish, but it was exactly the same system used by the Library of Congress and had been pioneered by Bertram Goodhue for Yale's Sterling Memorial. The problem with this arrangement at the New Bodleian was that the plan was confusing for readers. The main reading room in the New Bodleian itself, a key feature of any library, was not given special prominence in the plan, nor was it clearly brought to attention by exterior architectural decoration. Where decoration did create emphasis, it often did not reflect actual use. For instance, a door in the main lobby um, was surmounted by a stone Pegasus clock in a great anticlimax merely opened into the stacks, just like the unmarked doors on either side. Thinking of the library as a specialized warehouse, Scott designed the building in a way he hoped would maximize efficiency. He clearly thought that just as in a warehouse, the more doors that open directly into the central storage space, the more efficiently the library would operate. The result was corridors with long rows of numbered identical doors, which when opened, surreally all led to the same place. At the Cambridge University Library, however, he had been able to spread the plan over a larger site so that the building was entirely lit by natural light. His original design had looked like this, a dignified classical building in pink brick. However, the building was, was largely being funded by John D. Rockefeller, and Rockefeller asked if there was a way to give the building a more monumental presence on the Cambridge skyline, in keeping with its importance to the university community. At the same time, the building committee mandated that Scott abandon the cheerful pink bricks he had used at Clare College and replace them with a darker brick, more in keeping with the type historically used in Cambridge. The result was the famous brooding tower, which gave C.S. Lewis nightmares. I can't conclude this talk, of course, without discussing the red telephone box. Most of my thinking on this comes from Gavin Stamp, whose interpretation of these structures cannot be bettered. There was a movement in 1920s London for what was called tidiness in urban design. The idea was that streets should be cleared of the clutter of advertisements and random accretions of street furniture. In parallel to the teachings of Lethaby and the Design Industries Association, Lutchen felt that the unified signage, telephone, uh, that unif, uh, sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> Scott felt that unified signage, telephone boxes, benches, etc., would help to give the metropolis a sense of clarity and order. Each element should be in itself a work of art, but to be a good work of art, it had to respond to its context. The highest form of function occurred when an object was not only functional in and of itself, but in tune with its surroundings. Scott's red telephone boxes were not only designed to fit into the predominantly classical lines of London's neighborhoods, but they were carefully placed in response to their specific setting, symmetrically framing a wall behind or aligned with a major architectural element of neighboring buildings. <clears throat> 
1924, Scott had won a limited competition to design a telephone kiosk for the general post office. His design, known as kiosk number two, was specifically for the streets of central London. Um, and that's the design you see on the right in the image on the screen. The provision of phone boxes in most neighborhoods greatly improved London's communication infrastructure in a period when few people had telephones in their houses. The post office had initially proposed a fairly utilitarian kiosk, similar to a gardener's shed, with large plate glass panes set in wooden doors under a pyramidal roof. The metropolitan boroughs had objected to this design, asking for something more artistic. A simply utilitarian design was not seen to meet the needs of a great metropolis, as it lacked both a relationship to its surroundings and the monumentality that suggested permanence. The Royal Fine Arts Commission was called in to oversee a competition for a new design, and they awarded the commission to Scott. Of all of the entries, Scott's was the most aesthetically sympathetic capturing the monumental classicism of much urban design of the era, and thus not only complementing existing buildings, but also most other street furniture being produced, from bronze traffic signs to subtly classical park benches and iron railings. It was also the most pragmatic of the designs. Its decorative elements were cast into it rather than applied elements that could be stolen or broken, and it had few projecting moldings to catch water. Scott recommended that his design be painted silver with blue glass lettering and green interiors. The post office instead decided to go with red for visibility. Over the next decade, the demand for telephone boxes expanded. And in 1935, the year of uh, George V's Jubilee, Scott was called in to design a new smaller kiosk. For the K6 or Jubilee kiosk, as it was known, Scott simplified the detailing and designed more modern fenestration, thus easing production and updating the look for a kiosk that was to be distributed across the entire United Kingdom. The K6 was designed for use in both urban and rural locations. By the time of Scott's death in 1960, over 60,000 Scott designed kiosks of all types had been produced. They peppered the country becoming a defining feature of the British landscape. As a result of the telephone box designs, Scott developed a reputation as an industrial designer, and he was frequently brought in to domesticate new technologies destined for a London setting. He designed power stations at Battersea and Bankside, and he designed a set of electrically illuminated traffic signs. Battersea was clad in what Scott called human-scaled brick, and crowned with smokestacks like fluted columns. This hulking behemoth thus successfully echoes the brick houses trimmed with classical details across the river in Chelsea. To the same effect, the phone boxes were given glazing proportioned like sash windows, fluted moldings, a dome, and even a decorative heraldic crown. They were sympathetic to their neighbors, nodding to the proportions of London's Georgian and Regency squares, while using the Georgian strategy of modest simplicity to complement neighboring buildings regardless of style. The kiosks have strong architectural character, but are never dominant. Gavin Stamp has linked them to the tradition of garden pavilions. The phone box is nonetheless strikingly modern. It is a clever piece of industrial design, cast in metal, resistant to weather, graffiti, and wear, shielding its contents from damage. Clough Williams Ellis cited them in 1928 as a prime example of the good mass production of design. Williams Ellis asserts that through his telephone boxes, Scott became part of a broader movement to improve British industrial design. The same movement that was reflected in Charles Holden's underground stations, uh, which Scott himself so admired. Like the underground stations, Scott's power stations were custom pieces of high-tech infrastructure. The phone booths, however, went a step further towards fulfilling the Design and Industries Association ideal. They were genuinely mass-produced works of industrial art. I think I will conclude there. Uh, thank you, thank you very much.
Well, thank you, David. Um, it falls to me to have the pleasure and privilege of responding to your talk, which uh, I must say was eye-opening and mind-opening, um, partly because of the very well-selected detail that, uh, that you were able to insert to give us, I think, a, a, a rounded but not over kind of enclosed picture of, of Giles Gilbert Scott. It opened up a lot of questions uh, that uh, are not just about one person, but uh, as I had hoped, um, or to illuminate this uh, series of lectures uh, in terms of, of broader debates, issues, definitions. One thing I wanted to ask you is, do you think we're entering a new period of historiography, a new period of interpretation of this material, which for so long nobody really wanted to talk about. Gavin Stamp was exceptional in the fact that he did. Uh, yes, yes, uh, absolutely. Gavin was exceptional in that respect, as were you, Alan. <laughs> um, and, but I think we are entering entering a phase of historiography where the the sort of modernist tendency to dismiss any 20th century architecture that doesn't have an obvious um, sort of destination at international modernism um, is 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 falling aside, and historians are seeking to um, to view the architecture of that era through the eyes of the architects themselves and, and the critics of the time and to understand um, all of these different alternative modernisms that existed in the period. Um, I think we're seeing that more and more in, um, in books that are being published in Britain. And I think we're seeing it in the United States as well. Um, the pluralism of um, promoted by, by um, scholar architects such as, as, as Bob Stern, I think is beginning to have a mark on American scholarship. Yes, uh, thank, thank you very much for that. I'm, one thing I think that you brought up very well is, is this question of perception, particularly for work that maybe to, to quote a line by the English architectural cartoonist and writer, I guess you'd call him Sir Osbert Lancaster, um, he described the 1930s as a period for which the term transitional is the grossest of understatements. Uh, and uh, so much of what you showed was between one thing and another. And maybe this could be accounted as success, or maybe it can be counted, accounted as sort of double failure. Um, what do you think? Well, I, I think Scott would have counted it as a success. And I think that Scott would have argued that all periods are transitional, that architecture is constantly changing. Um, and that, you know, the, the interwar period was faced with a, a particularly um, rapid set of transformations, but that the ability to, to process transformation is, is one of the architect's tasks. Yes, I think that's, uh, that's very helpful. I mean, I, seeing your slides and thinking about them, I, I thought, is there um, an issue between volume, uh, for which Scott was, you know, a supreme exponent, uh, and, and the surface? And I feel at that, the church at Northfleet, that very early one, uh, he never does it better than he does it there. Yes, yes, I think that's that's very true, um, and Scott Scott was was very interested in um, surprisingly was very interested in in formalism and the theories of of Roger Fry about uh, about the way that art could be and architecture could be abstracted into its most basic kind of elements of 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 plane and mass and form and line all of the the sort of principles of art that we we hear about in high school art classes. Um, Scott was a was an enormous fan of Roger Fry's and in fact built a um, built a house in the Surrey Hills that was a, a sort of imitation of Durbin's um, uh, Fry's own house where he attempted to to abstract the the moldings and the form of the house into into something uh, that, that reached towards an architectural essential. Um, so I think Scott was thinking about his architecture, particularly in his Edwardian days, as if uh, the architecture were uh, were an abstract sculpture. 
he, he described himself, his design process as imagining himself carving his buildings out of um, enormous cliffs of stone. Mm. Well, they, they certainly convey that feeling. And then somehow the stone acquires odd sort of um, frills. <laughs> I think one could almost call them. Yes. Uh, and I have to say, I find that disturbing. Uh, when you showed the Library of Congress against the Bodleian, I thought, yeah, give me the Library of Congress every time. I mean, maybe it wouldn't sit so well in the centre of Oxford, but I think actually it could have. Well, no, I, I agree with that assessment. But that, I mean, it, of course, becomes a matter of personal taste on some level. Um, Scott, Scott's detailing, Scott believed that detailing was essential to making a building have a human scale. And I think on, on some level, he's right. It's, it's, it's moldings and carvings and architectural sculpture that help to, uh, to relate a building to its human users. He didn't want to lose that. Um, and it was the detailing of his Gothic that was particularly celebrated by critics. So I think he was, he was perhaps very wrapped up in, in the idea of, of creating and, and, and inventive detailing for all of his buildings. The new Bodleian is not his most successful building. Um, and I, I think, you know, when you look at the detailing on the church at Northfleet, for instance, I think it works very well. Um, and the, the building is a, is a very successful whole. Um, but when you look at the new Bodleian, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't work as well, but Scott had an awfully challenging brief there. It's true, it's true. And uh, I think what's been done in its recent transformation, actually, uh, maybe there's not very much of Scott left inside, but uh, it's certainly done something to it. It's a huge improvement. The, the, the new Bodleian, for those of you who don't know, has been transformed into the Western Library, which is a, um, uh, an amazing, uh, largely public space for exhibitions and a cafe and a gift shop and all the things the Bodleian needed uh, facing Broad Street and the, the core of steel stacks, which turned out to be an enormous fire hazard as so many 20th century libraries, including the New York Public Library have, have realized and had to, had to renovate. Um, it was ripped out and replaced with an amazing sort of um, tall central atrium and, and it cleared out space for uh, a much more usable set of spaces for the modern for the modern Bodleian and, and all the books that had been stored there are now kept off site. Yes, well, it's interesting. Some some of his buildings have uh, so, uh, kind of undergone this internal transformation, this sort of um, removal and opening, and uh, the power station ones, uh, the two London power stations, in their different ways, uh, have have undergone this, um, yeah. with possibly varying degrees of success. I don't know. Um, Yes, uh, one of the other things I, I thought was interesting because it it sort of came through as a theme was uh, one sense of decorum, uh, which is always there. It's not a word that's used very often in talking about architecture, but it uh, you know when our our king in his former role uh, would talk about buildings, he would often. Um, discuss them in terms of decorum that they look something that they shouldn't look like uh like a, a nuclear bunker or uh, an academy for secret policemen those were two of his choice comments um and i think we're all prone to that that we have expectations uh which is what decorum is really about and thus the the jazz band in westminster abbey is one way of describing a, a breach of decorum now do you think scott managed that decorum successfully um i think in general he did he he perhaps did not at the new bodleian but he was certainly trying he was he was very immersed in the idea of uh of a set of architectural good manners he you chose a stone that was meant to blend with its its oxford neighbors he designed the height of each one of those stepped levels and the facade of the new bodleian to respond to the height of an important Oxford building across the street. He made sure that the central tower was not taller than the cupola 
of the Sheldonian, that the top terrace was not higher than the pediment of the Clarendon building. Um, he pulled the building back slightly from the street edge in order to create a more decorous um, sort of public square in front of the Clarendon building. He was very, he, he aligned the, um, the ceremonial entrance to the new Bodleian with the, the uh, ceremonial interest that, in, uh, axis that runs through the Clarendon, the new Bodleian, the Radcliffe camera to the university church. He was trying very, very hard to, to be decorous. And he felt it extremely, uh, extremely strongly when uh, everybody thought he had failed at doing that. Yes, well, it's it's a it was a very tough one. I mean, it's interesting in a sense you defined it in a series of negatives. You know, he didn't do this and he didn't do that, and maybe that's what um, has upset people with that building. But uh, how do you win? Right. Uh, it's time for me to draw to a close and thank you once more, David, for a very stimulating, illuminating uh, lecture that I think has has brought us forward from the first lecture into the uh, the interwar period and indeed somewhere beyond it. And by mentioning Charles Holden, you have prepared the way for Elaine Harwood's talk on Holden. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see them as paired figures. So um, I will hand back now to Ted. Thank you very much, Alan. I'd like to thank David Lewis, Alan Powers and Rosemary Hill for their participation in what was truly an excellent program. Thank you. Uh, I also wanted to remind everyone of the dates for the upcoming lectures in the series. Charles Holden, an architect of many styles and subtle forms, with Elaine Harwood, will take place on Thursday, March 30th, and Modernism, Revolution or Reinvention, with Alan Powers, will take place on Thursday, April 27th. Information on the British Architectural Library Trust can be found on its website, thebaltrust.org, and information on the 20th Century Society can be found on its website, c20society.org.uk. Thank you again very much for joining us today.